fine is boom okay so i think we can start the round now so without the father you can have the prime minister here here Um, hi, do, are we starting? Uh, yeah. Okay, um, okay. QI uh, in the chat, please, and uh, I'll get to you with that said. A flourishing democratic society is one where its occupants are fully aware and capable of making independent decisions based on trust in the system and the information given to them. Progress is impossible when the media has perverse incentive to amplify lopsided messages proud to propose. Firstly, who will be affected by the doctrine? We think this is a traditional large broadcast news company who, are shaped, who shape the opinion of the world and brand themselves as carrier of truth, like CNN or Sky News. But we also want to include social media-based companies that also have significant audiences. This is like political or ground news. Once news companies pass a certain threshold of viewership, we think this is when the fairness doctrine becomes applicable to them. Here's how it works. No, this is not about what topic is covered, so do not come up with a censorship argument, but it is about having both sides of one issue. It will look like these news companies covering controversial issues of public importance, like the recent US Supreme Court decision on abortion, or in Malaysia, where the government was exposed to have spent six billion ringgits on a Navy ship that never existed. And then we do so with equal and adequate coverage of diverse viewpoints, as in having diverse programming, different teams and speakers on different topics to ensure an equitable discussion. For example, channels who have to invite equally reputable experts and panelists from both sides to discuss. There will be an independent governmental agency to monitor and ensure that this is a good faith effort to give both sides um, of these issues. It is reasonably easy to detect operations based on bad faith. For example, if a network continually relegates opposition viewpoints to lower viewership time slots, fails to invite credible speakers or unfairly start the environment to benefit one side, we are happily to, to penalize corporations and channels that do not adhere to their doctrine. Our stance is very simple. We believe that the truth comes out best when both sides are presented, interacted, and battled, and let viewers analyze and make decisions for themselves. This debate is about better democracy, journalism, and conversation. First argument, then, on how the Venice Doctrine remedies political polarization. The problem in the status quo is that people are trapped in an echo chamber that exposes them to the same message over and over again, leading them to reaffirm existing biases without questioning them. For example, things like the radical right-wing individuals storming Capitol Hill happen because they are constantly bombarded by Fox News narratives that liberals are toxic forces that will ruin America. Why then is this happening? Before I move on to analysis of how this is happening, I would like to take a few lines. Yeah, the Capitol Hill riots was organized and all discussed on underground news streams like Parlor. How exactly is your analysis of this? The reason why they are driven into these underground news is because Fox News give legitimization to these kinds of fake, un fake understanding. So they look further into it to reinforce their bias and look for underground news. Your side of the house is bringing them to underground news. Why then is this happening? This is happening because people select their favorite news channel based on proximity and familiarity. Like what your parents watch is what you grow up watching. So it's just factually in factually correct that the majority of people do not watch both CNN and Fox News. But moreover, news is partisan and extremely divisive because currently the media is oversimplified and exaggerated on both sides of the bench. This refers to conservative media with scapegoating of minorities such as the China virus narrative in 2020 that led to rampant attacks against Asians in America or in liberal media that ridicules and mocks the other side without an incentive to genuinely engage. Why then is going to worsen an opposition without an end? Because there's a race to the bottom in incentive caused by toxic competition amongst news agencies in a dying market. This happens because the rise of social media platforms means falling readership for traditional podcast and news media. And also there's a profit incentive to capture as much of the limited viewership as possible and compete with each other. News channels then are now so desperate that they will be willing to lean into whatever appeals to more people and radicalize playing into biases rather than accurate information. So media, <clears throat> media companies 
Furthermore, media companies are often owned by individuals or organizations with vested political interests. For example, Rupert Murdoch's New Corp, which has so much influence on the media landscape and tried to push climate change narratives out of it due to their vested interest in oil companies that two ex-prime ministers of Australia labeled them as a cancer on democracy. How will then the fairness doctrine solve this problem? <clears throat> The premise of this is that the viewers are less likely to be pushed and pulled towards one radical end of the spectrum. This debate is not about con like reducing concern or whatever, but this debate is about lessening like radicalism on both ends. The average reasonable viewer will not uh, will adopt a balanced point of view and make rational decision. How then does this change occur? I think firstly, it will be exposure because currently viewers have very little incentive to compare different point of views and hence turn to channels that are comfortable and familiar and feed into their biases. So moderates are exposed to an environment that slowly nurtures radical perspective. The extremists on the left and right of the right of either side of the debate are literally are unlikely to change. However, the fairness doctrine does provide them an opportunity to be exposed to content and opinion that they would never voluntarily look up before. Then this will lead to a shift in consumer perception because viewers are now restored their faith in media as a voice of reason and knowledge compared to the pseudo entertainment status news channel that we have today. Then there will be a containment of extremist and radical view because currently mainstream media gives weight and legitimizes fake news when it features them in its broadcast. This is also a further elaboration on their PY because, for example, conspiracy from QAnon, such as stop the steal narrative that the liberal establishment were conspiring to deny Trump a free and fair election, went from being fringe belief that only the most radical believed into being mainstream conservative tactics talking points once Fox News popularized and spread them into a much wider audience. The importance, the, um, the importance of this point is that conspiracy and fake news are a danger to society when there is enough support and clout behind them. And this happens because of because these broad, traditional broadcast news media with significant reach are legitimizing them and broadcasting them. Current media creates this cloud as they serve as the entry point for the moderate viewer and make the moderate viewer even more radicalized. What's the impact of this two prong of impact? <clears throat> So um, first prong of impact then on the individual, how we create dialogues based on empathy, respect, and rational thought. Because fairness doctrine ensures the space that is required for individuals across the spectrum to feel hurt. Because in the status quo, conservative feel undermined, mistreated, and underrepresented, which oftentimes fuels further xenophobia, homophobia, and other phobia to, towards minority groups. This is also why they are driven more into underground sources, when they think that current traditional media sources are not representing their viewpoints. But two, is that at the same time, liberals refuse to engage based on moral superiority and the wokeness of the issue, instead of acknowledging differences and the cause of misinformation. Fairness doctrine then enables individuals to form opinions based on news that present both sides of the issue, that is independent of personal preferences and familiarity of a certain channel. Second prong of impact then is that when individuals change, the political landscape benefits from this significantly. Because when we force media companies to cover what is actually important rather than what gets them the most clout and views, this creates discussion of issues like climate change and conservative cycles or circles rather than vastly disproportionate coverage on outrage inducing subjects such as trans athletes in sport. Second, we reduce partisan gridlocks as sides are more capable of understanding one another and seeking for compromise, which is an essential L ingredient in getting any actual legislation to pass, electing moderate candidates, and so on. Finally, we lessen active violence breaking out because there's a very short pathway for emotion to, regarding these marginalized issues to turn into destructive actions that harm others, like the shooting in Buffalo or like the great replacement theory. It is a number game. Even a small number of radical individuals being pushed over the fringe can result in violent outbursts. Therefore, the fairness doctrine decreases polarization, improves societal engagement and individuals' well-being. We can no longer let the status quo stand. Opposition must engage, proud to propose. Uh, I thank the Prime Minister for the speech. Can I have the leader of the opposition? Here, here. Hi, can I be heard? Uh, yes, you can. All right. Starting my speech in three, 
two, one. Proposition mandates rebuttals to issues of human dignity. When the opposition to abortion rights is the patriarchy, the objection to gay marriage is homophobia, and the justification of police brutality is bigotry. The fairness doctrine doesn't platform neutrality, it platforms oppression. Before that, the stance from opposition is three things. One, we support the open market for media, which has a self-correcting mechanism in the form of competition to meet consumer demands, so companies with poor journalistic practices are naturally shut out of the market. In the wake of Cambridge Analytica, there is a rise in media where consumers are highly critical about the information presented to them and how media organizations could be exploiting them. More than ever, consumers are politically conscious and they value media organizations that practice responsible journalism. Therefore, competition among media outlets gives them the incentive to mutually scrutinize non-factual and exploitative reporting. Secondly, status quo has existing mechanisms against misinformation and fake news, as first proposition claims, such as fact-checking, which we see in two forms. One is enforced by the state and companies such as rooting out COVID-19 misinformation online. And the second is conducted by independent media who are signatory of the International Fact-Checking Network, such as factcheck.org and localized versions like Africa Check. Lastly, Crucially, OP does not need to prove that we're able to break the most entrenched echo chambers, but rather that PROP does more harm than good in incentivizing people to retreat into them. Before I talk about the two arguments to fall from opposition, three responses to the speaker before me. Firstly, on their mechanism, I think we would like to note that propositions equitable discussions doesn't necessarily mean that you have equal representation, i.e. having equal error time or even equal credibility of speakers under the fairness doctrine doesn't translate into equal weight in practice. Metrics that measure the persuasive power of each speaker are subjective. Comparing between a professor of politics with greater expertise versus a community leader with greater influence who are both equally powerful in their own ways, especially since the speakers don't possess the same style of engagement. For example, less confrontational speakers disproportionately make concessions to aggressive ones and making fair representation therefore almost impossible to micromanage across media outlets who may deliberately use this gray area to select speakers' advantages to their ideological leanings. Even proposition themselves concedes this by telling you there are instances of biases and they want to regulate all of this, but we are telling you it is inherently impossible. In fact, we think a Oppressors are usually awarded more social currency and can get away with being more aggressive and more dominant within these quote unquote fair discussions. For example, an overly aggressive black man is seen as a threat, while an aggressive white man is seen as a confident leader. When proposition hinges their entire case on, on the characterization of media being biased, their policy requires them to entrust the enforcement of the fairness doctrine to bad faith actors, which means on proposition, they do have subjectivity and they don't get equality. But secondly, let's talk about the argument on echo chambers. Number three things to say here. Number one, they tell you that people, we think that the people who are the biggest stakeholders in this debate are the ones who already have an active incentive to be politically conscious. Why is this so? Because the only reason why you are consuming news media over the thousands of other media you could be consuming, like pop culture and music, is because you have an active incentive to be involved in the political scene. Meaning that on our side of the house, a majority of the individuals are likely to be moderates or likely to be rational enough to seek out counter narratives. If they were so entrenched in their echo chambers, proposition changes nothing because of secondly we think they move underground because uh they move underground because they they don't trust the mainstream media proposition says that they move underground because fox news legitimizes this but we don't think that's necessarily true that's empirically untrue because underground platforms are in fact empowered when people lose trust in what they can easily access so they seek other alternatives to verify their viewpoints instead but thirdly when they tell us that the media has the incentive to play into biases i think we would note that while status quo is not perfect we would say that not all media biases are playing into racial stereotypes types and harmful biases. Insofar as our proposition uses the example of Capitol Hill's rights, for example, prop would require CNN to justify the Capitol Hill rights, i.e. spreading misinformation about why the election was rigged. Proposition has to defend a world where liberal bubbles will also become saturated with conservative views, and we think that's in fact far worse because it leads to the dehumanization of minorities. Crucially on perceived representation, conservatives will never seek representation in CNN because it is not their main sphere. But if Fox News becomes saturated with liberal news because the state forces it, I think that's when they go underground. Lastly, on the impact on discourse, we think that's contingent on healthy discourse, especially since discuss these discussions are usually crucial to their identities. I think it's far likely to be more aggressive instead of constructive. Two arguments then to forward from opposition. Firstly, on why the state must not mandate the violation of moral minimums in mainstream media. Three parts. One, proposition platforms and spreads dehumanizing political rhetoric when media houses in the status quo recognize moral boundaries when it comes to reporting by not providing extensive details about suicide victims and methods and promoting suicide hotlines instead because it is important 
decision not to perpetuate the legitimacy of suicide to society. Prop contravenes this via mandating equal platforming, as one side of controversial discussions will be defending police brutality in the US, the use of Nazi symbols in Germany, and other positions which actively require them to justify oppressions, innately including dehumanizing rhetoric. Given the media is a culturally normative force, it creates the permission mechanisms that allow society to emulate the discriminatory language that the media has legit legitimized as so-called fair discussion. Unlike on op, prop lacks the ability to criticize such rhetoric for two reasons. One, discriminatory rhetoric is disguised as neutral discussions, failing bigotry behind a veneer of legitimacy within mainstream media. Contrasting to opposition, a small number of outlets engaging in this can be delegitimized and deplatformed. But now, bigoted rhetoric once exclusive to this site is propagated in all news sites, making bigotry mainstream and signaling it is appropriate to hold this view. Secondly, back and forth debate between competing views means viewers get desensitized to morally grievous claims. The gravity of those claims lessen over time when we view this as being yet another debate much like how American voters get less and less outraged by the depravity of Donald Trump. Secondly, safe spaces of discourse are violated as minorities are forced to justify their oppression. Instead of allowing minorities a safe space to share their lived experiences, prop mandates that they have to exist in an adversarial climate. Before I go on, I'll take a point. Taking that as none, for example, on... yes. Yeah. You can see that the majority of viewers will be moderate. When your side turns moderate into radical because you push them into watching Fox News every single day, how are you going to be better? So why are they forced to watch Fox News? We already told you they have an incentive to seek out counter narratives. But other than that, they can also watch CNN and a plethora of other views. What you do is that you force liberal media to have conservative views, and we think that is harmful. So on our side of the house, the illustration is that a transgender person sharing their gender identity journey is forced to face opponents who believe that gender dysphoria is a mental illness and accusations of being a sexual predator just because they want to use a bathroom that matches their gender, requiring every minority to be traumatized in the process of advocacy. The second argument is about how the fairness doctrine pushes people towards underground information streams. Number one, they force media companies to platform all ideologies and therefore alienate viewers from mainstream media. People are then pushed towards echo chambers due to a trust deficit between the people and the media when mainstream media platforms are seen as a tool of a state to engineer social narratives. Secondly, the counterfactual isn't exposure to diverse media, but rather alternative and unregulated information streams. Dreams. Individuals abandon the major regulated media platforms in favor of underground platforms, which are unaffected by the fairness structure and under propositions model. Encrypted social networking sites like Parler seem an underground echo chambers because these alternate platforms are immune to criticism as they exist in the deepest parts of the internet. The entrenchment of alternative media empowers misinformed political choices. Trump's 2016 campaign saturated Facebook with millions of targeted ads, effectively replacing mainstream media with his political rhetoric. With the majority of Trump voters consuming their news from Facebook, the information led to his rise to power. We co-opt all of Proposition's benefit when we prove that the people whom they try to save from their echo chambers fall deeper into it. Proud to oppose. Uh, I find the speaker for this speech. Can I have the second proposition speaker? Here, here. All right, um, I'll take my POIs in the chat, please. I will try to get to you as soon as I can. Three, two, one. Okay, now the fact that our opponents conflate conservative ideology with bigotry is indicative of the exact reason why we need to increase exposure to different ideas. But a couple of things before I, uh, before I move on to my speech. Number one, they said our fairness is non-mechanized and that a lot of companies can exploit this loophole in order to further perpetrate the status quo. Number one, this is simply not true. We have told you we are happy to imply fines. We are happy to penalize those who are willing and who keep perpetrating the status quo. But also, uh, but also additionally, uh, uh, but also additionally, when in order to gain competitive uh, also, 
also additionally, even if some new channel try to find and successfully exploit this loophole, the harms only materialize insofar as all or the majority of news channel also do the same thing. Because one, there is now a higher standard. Their legitimacy will instantly be doubted because of diverse opinions is available everywhere now. And this is the standard for fairness. If you don't have this, you are not fair. Your news channel is delegitimized. But also two, the appeal to consumer. It's really simple. One guy ranting versus two guy ranting at each other, which is more appealing. This is very obvious when uh, when news channel provide discourse, when news channel provide debate, when news channel actually actually dig at the root of, of logic and ideology. We think this appeals far more to consumer. And uh, as long as these fairness doctrine is applied, uh, applied uh, um, news media will have an incentive to change. But furthermore, uh, the ability point here is the ability to achieve absolute fairness is impossible. However, the point of the fairness doctrine is that you take both sides on their best ground, you invite their best expert, you invite their best representation ideology for them to combat against each other so that the truth comes out. Uh, we do not think this is a fair ground for opposition to Texas on. But also moving on to my two clashes today, number one on news quality and number two on democracy. Let's look at number one, let's look at what they have given us. They told us that our side of the house will be dehumanizing, that people will be desensitized, and that we will legitimize um, we will legitimize things that are often controversial, like bad ideology. Let's tackle this. Number one, in regards to dehumanizing to people. Phil, if this is about finding solidarity for trans athletes, news media is not the place. You can do that elsewhere. Those alternatives exist. News media is when you interact with the other side. Panel has to prove, uh, panel opposition has to prove here why other platforms of safe spaces do not exist on our side. And also actually show why safe spaces is so important in the first place because liberal movements tend to have the tendency to message among themselves and do not interact with other side and expect other people to believe them. Uh, this actually is the reason why you turn a lot of moderate and slightly conservative uh, uh, supporters away. Like for instance, uh, the VOM actually lost momentum because they kept uh, th because they kept uh, talking about defund the police within themselves without actually uh, without actually explaining it to the other side, turning moderate away, uh, turning a lot of moderates away from BLM. You know, if you stick to your ideology, you don't grow. Your movement actually fails. For instance, take the ML, uh, take take Martin Luther King. He made a much stronger effort to reach across the aisle, like the march in Washington, for instance. The whole reason why the Civil Rights Act was passed in the first place was because MLK was able to compromise and discuss with the other side. We the far better way to achieve the end goal of the trans movement, i.e. achieve trans right or advocacy, is to challenge anti-trans narrative and not to let them fester. But also, the expert in participation in this discussion consented to participate in here. If you're a trans, if you're a trans person who feels like you won't be able to handle this kind of thing you do not participate but also let's tackle the idea of desensitization this is equal this is just factually false people get equally angered on the uh, uh, no matter how many mass shootings there are in a month people get equally ang uh, um, so the desensitization is just weird but also uh, uh but moving on how we on the uh, let's look at my extension how, how we on the side have actually higher quality of journalism because the journalistic incentive will always be the bottom line of profit. So traditionally, they have done this by appealing to a select demographic and retain their loyalty by feeding into pre-existing beliefs and diverging away from contradictory narratives that might cause cognitive dissonance and uncomfortability. So the main comparative advantage for a lot of news sources in status quo is their political leaning. So the race to the bottom appears here. The more one-sided you are, the more profit you get. So how does the fairness complete and fairness doctrine completely change this? When the fairness doctrine imposes a regulatory measures across the bench, this doesn't change the profit incentive of news media. So in order to gain competitive advantage, they have to, disquit, they have to distinguish themselves in other ways instead. This is like seeking out more unique perspective, like in a discussion about climate change, for instance, you don't take as climate doomerism or climate advocacy and, and, but, and, and, and oh, climate change doesn't exist. You take perspective from indigenous people, people on the ground in order to stand out and, uh, and, and uh, stand out from other news sources. Uh, secondly, we think this also looks like some companies will do very aggressive kind of rebuttal style of debating, but others will specialize in more logical academic debates in order to appeal to various different demographics. There are different ways companies can go about this, and they have an incentive to do so. The impact here is that you lead on a race, you flip the race to the bottom, and you create a race to the top to achieve the highest quality of journalism. You change consumer preference, and you improve democracy, and you eliminate the worst actors in the news industry with political agenda who are trying to misinform people. Before I move on to the second class, I'll take that POI.
the duty of the media isn't to engineer liberal outcomes, it is morality. So what is unengaged from our case is that the same conservative viewpoints oppose the very humanity of individuals, i.e. literally saying that trans individuals are not human. Why is it moral on your side of the house? Okay, number one, we never said it was moral. The difference here is that instead of letting these anti-trans narratives just fester one-sidedly for half the country, what you do now is that you integrate liberal ideology into those same channels. So you get so if you if you really do believe that trans right is the correct morality here, then of course when they battle it out, the anti-trans will be debunked. And the end, the truth stands is that trans right trans people do deserve that. And this is what we advocate for on our side of the house, whereas your side of the house has to protect half the country just listening to anti-trans narratives. But moving on to democracy. Um, opposition gave us two, three things. Number one, echo chambers changes nothing. Number two is that um, you push people to the ground. Number three is that there will be no healthy discourse. The third reason they just stated it without giving any analysis as to why, but also let's tackle the push people to the ground. Couple of responses. Number one, people already do this. Number two, this is not true. Most people don't care enough in order to do this. Take for one example, uh, when Trump got kicked out of Twitter, yeah, conservative were like very angry about it, but when he moved to this platform called the real truth or whatever, did anyone move there? No, because they don't care enough. It's too much work. They will still stay at these particular places. But also three, underground channels actually get smaller on our side of the house because now various channels across the political spectrum allow them a voice on national broadcast. So you have a, they have, because they have a popularity incentive, they will leave underground channels for national broadcast. But also, let's take them on the worst, uh, let's take, let's take them the best case. Even if people do go, this is fine because underground discussion is only dangerous insofar as they are hyped up and legitimized by national broadcast. Because opposition can't say that everyone will go to the same underground source, they cannot co opt this. Rosa, but we're, uh, now that I've debunked uh, their main push against our claims, let's review what we have given you. We told you that we uniquely eliminate alienation between people. We disallow the straw manning and misunderstanding that is integral to the kind of polarization and lack of mediation in the, in the status quo. For individuals, we give you dialogue, but for the larger political landscape, we give you a better informed voters because now they take both sides of the spectrum and not simply one side. We have better voting panel, you have better containment of extremist or radical val values, and you get a better democracy as a whole. Pro so proud to win on proposition. I thank the speaker for this speech. Can I have the second opposition speaker here? here. Yeah, can I confirm that I'm audible? Ah, uh, yes, you are. Okay, great. Um, I'll take my POIs verbally, so just unmute yourselves. Setting up my timer. Starting in three, two, one. It is truly ironic that on site proposition, they wanted to argue for the minority. They wanted to argue championing leftist ideals and ensuring that society is a far better democracy. When, we, when they were the ones that handed bigots the megaphone, when in the last bits of the second proposition speech, they conceded in trying to respond and mitigate to our harms that actually news and underground sites become smaller because they broadcast them and they gave them a platform. The reason why proposition needs to take the loss immediately is because they never fulfilled their burden. On one hand, their entire first argument was only contingent in half of these scenarios in terms of when conservative bubbles and conservative echo chambers are now flooded with neutrality and the fairness doctrine. But they needed to concede, therefore, the converse of that situation as well, which is that in protected liberal echo chambers, in protected liberal circles, where these were the safe spaces that you quote unquote said they could default to, that you would erode all of those situations and you would turn the previously leftist individuals on defense towards conservatism, which is why their first argument needs to fall, because their first argument does not actually fulfill their burden in terms of the harms equally applied symmetrically in the converse. All they get is individuals politically confused and within a political deadlock. But second, Note that before I move on to my uh, later parts of the speech, what have they not responded to from first opposition? Note that they say that there is no actual engagement or no actual analysis as to why individuals would pivot and go to underground news streams. Note that they, they, they 
know that this is an extremely important argumentation because I think it kills off the entirety of prop bench because their first argument on political polarization and their second argument on better outcomes for democracy and social outcomes are all contingent on buy-in because only insofar as people actually subscribe and absorb the information under the fairness doctrine in their world are they able to materialize the harms which is why after uh, at least one or two minutes of anal analysis from first opposition the response that we heard from second and prop was insufficient, if not disingenuous. They said that it is far too much work to go to underground streams. But what was the nuance that we provided to you in first opposition? And they continuously affirmed this in first and second proposition when their whole argumentation was trying to re-engineer the way in which individuals work. If their end outcome was liberalism and individuals tried to be empathetic, they actively tried to change conservative viewpoints and actively tried to change conservative ideals, which is why it directly fed into the first opposition clash and the first opposition point in terms of there exists a massive trust deficit in status quo that you're going to exacerbate in the first place, which is why individuals are more likely to turn to other forms of information that are unlikely to be regulated or far harder to regulate on our side, because individuals actively feel like, they're in, they're, like their choices and the information that they consume are propaganda and state machine and state sanction, which means that they are unable or unwilling to actually want to engage in that. That is number one in terms of pushing towards echo chamber. But number two, we gave you a far more nuanced rebuttal preemptively in terms of even if they didn't pivot towards these kinds of information streams underground, how do people absorb the information is necessarily important. Because I think proposition only wanted to hinge their case on the truly ignorant, that these are people that live literally insulated, never heard a counter to racism, and therefore the exposure meant they changed their minds. The reason why this is, this is an important response is opposition will be the only team to actually analyze how do people internalize and process this information and what are the conclusions that they come to? If they believe that the state is trying to engineer they, their choice, that the only reason Fox News is platforming this liberal speaker that is invited is not because we truly believe that it's a legitimate viewpoint, but rather that the state requires us to do this or else on their side, you would take away their licenses and find them. That means for the individuals that they're trying to characterize who are truly bigoted, did not want to change their viewpoints, that these individuals are likely going to selectively hear and selectively reinforce what is on the media. So it does not matter that after each article, there's a liberal viewpoint. After each interview, there's another liberal individual speaking. Do the individual and the people that they wanted to cater to, their stakeholder of the bigoted, actually care? We told you not. But lastly, before I move on to a substantive rebuttal, is it even uh, is it even legitimate to change the viewpoints of individuals and their quote-unquote good outcome? Because we would say that democracies inherently reflect the will of the people. If society was overtly conservative, as proposition would like to characterize, it would not only be impossible possible, but also immoral for the state to socially engineer the media to indoctrinate their populations. Given this characterization of society, it would also instead push society to seek through their preferred information through underground streams, like we've already affirmed. But the last argumentation that they never wanted to actually properly engage with on the moral minimums in society, what was their response? that we need to prove why safe spaces were inherently important. Note that safe spaces, firstly, was only one layer of that response. We argued that there are certain moral minimums that should exist in society regardless. The same way media and organized media organizations ban, for example, hate speech, is because we recognize that certain language, certain things that are dehumanizing to certain people's identity are things that we should not go and cross the line towards. Unless proposition would like to argue against hate speech, they would have to likely lose the debate. Their only response, therefore, was why don't they pivot elsewhere to other places? We told you, number one, how the introduction of these conservative values in other liberal safe spaces means that you actually don't have safe spaces altogether under the neutrality that they quote unquote want to protect, but also that it's important that you don't consent to this participation because on our side, you can uniquely only be platformed in spaces where you feel or felt safe. On proposition, the only place that you can be platformed always and requires you and is mandated by the state to always have an opposition towards your view. So even if you can quote unquote consent, most individuals don't even feel safe enough to even be part of that discussion in the first place. But they agree that it's a culturally normative force. So that is why it's important to platform these kinds of things and ensure the correct ideologies and the correct viewpoints are actually being channeled in the first place. Which means that if it's not important for trans people and they should go elsewhere, if the media is culturally normative, that means that they are able to impact the way people are able to perceive them. And the safe spaces matters the most because safe spaces in a small community versus safe spaces being, be being able to be perpetuated over society is what matters. Before I move on, is our point. 
I don't think you're really listening to us. We're never, we're never talking about like reducing conservatism. We are fine with flooding liberal with conservative ideas as long as they are debunked and debated and allow people to listen to each other. Please engage. Then you have to contradict your first argumentation. So your third proposition speaker needs to tell me therefore why your first argument even matters if you're not going to champion changing individuals viewpoints. On to a third substantive as to how the fairness doctrine worsens the political climate and causes information deadlocks. Two layers here. First, prop creates an aggressive political climate that highlights and cements division in ideology. We are mandating all news and ideologies to exist in a competitive format, which will be extremely flawed, which is why it was the critical nuance from first opposition as well, as to what is the moral difference and the categorical difference in terms of the ideology that you mandate. On one hand, some news sites choose to engage in this on their own volition, but we can hold them accountable, versus the state crossing the moral boundary and crossing the moral line by forcing all media sites and being a culprit towards an oppression. Therefore, presenters choose the easier, low-hanging fruit rhetoric in order to sway the audience rather than complex, intellectually honest engagement that prop is expecting. But second, discourse is not equal even under the fairness doctrine. We never said that prop had to defend absolute fairness. All we told you is that the implementation of the fairness doctrine can never work even if, and they're able to skirt the loopholes and still not be fine because they're still actually mandating and following the structure. A few things. Number one, strategic selection of minority speakers who advocate against minority issues. This looks like Republicans fueling Candace Owens to argue against Black Americans and then delegitimize the suffering of individuals. Second, it's selecting speakers with different levels of charisma and eloquence. A charismatic speaker is going to be far more able to captivate audiences that could easily sway towards Republican values that they deter. But third, it can also like speakers relying on viscerality of certain perspectives, like late-term abortion and showing a video of babies being torn apart. On our side, we protect the integrity of media and protecting the integrity of individual thought. I thank the speaker for the speech. Can I have the third proposition speaker? Here, here. Um, am I clearly visible and audible? Thank you. Uh, just give me one second just to um, put up my time. My speech will start now. Now, notice how our position's case only stands and only has a real impact to the extent that they try to strongman our case, the things that we've told you and the way that the world actually works. Look, our end goal has never been, you know, trying to push liberalism onto every single person or to change radical people's minds. It's to make people chill on both sides of the house and to make sure that they are, don't get pushed down the road to radicalism because they only see one kind of TV, only one political um, side of the political spectrum every single day because that's the way that people behave. That's the way the confirmation bias works. Look, liberal media, liberal media is not perfect, unlike what the op side says, and can, neither is conservative media, both because they perform their own side and only report their own narratives exclusively and ridicule the other. We solve this, not changing people's minds. Opposition did the wrong word in pushing and trying to say, oh, we're going to change people's minds in this, this and those, that way. No, what we're telling you is to give you information so that people can make up their own minds and do the in thinking and reasoning through things themselves. But sure, let's say changing people's minds is what we are about here. We are far more likely to do that when we flood conservative media with liberal ideals. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, I'll take POIs verbally. Um, we are more likely to, when we flood conservative media with liberal ideals than we flood liberal media with conservative media, right? Because what to the extent these ideas are able to be debunked if they're wrong, as opposite to trying to tell you, or it's just, you know, reduce the impacts of these ideas, which are purely, or in many cases, just mostly based on rhetoric, we make sure that people are less likely to buy into these ideas to such a large extent and go to such lengths to harm other people because they believe that trans people should not exist, right? 
but also let's point out a few things from opposition. Number one, opposite that people are rational enough to think critically and look at alternative sources, but also that there's such misguided blank slates, so they would just believe racism the moment they see it on TV. Which characterization is it? Which one do you want to use? But also, Let's move on to main clashes in the debate and prove you why on all of the main clashes, proposition wins, right? Three main clashes. Number one, on polarization. We get a few ideas from opposition. Number one, they tell you these individuals are likely to be rational enough, they seek a country narratives. We already give you a response on this, but we'll add more to that later. Secondly, you say that you push Latin people, I think a bit, Latin people towards conservatism because liberal bubbles, bubbles become saturated with conservative views, and you have to ensure the correct viewpoints are being channeled. Three, you said that you could go underground because more labor viewpoints in places like Fox News. Why are all these ideas untrue? Number one, on individuals. Look, what is the incentive for them to seek out counter narratives? It usually means you have to go out of your way to seek out another source, check whether it's a similar or opposing view, and then read through their articles. We get no proof from opposition as to why these people have the incentive to spend their time and energy doing so, other than, oh, they're always probably politically more, they're probably politically engaged. Look, look at the status quo. There are people who turn from moderates to extreme right wing radicals simply by watching Fox News, and even though they were politically engaged at the start, they totally went down this path. On proposition inside the house, even if these people have this kind of incentives, they aren't perfect in their ability to always do so and do so in a balanced way. On proposition, at the very least, we take away the giant burden they have to take on when they have to go out and find these things. It would make it so much easier for them to get opposing viewpoints. Secondly, on people moving underground. Let's explore this, right? Why exactly do people move underground? The people who are underground and actively go underground, the opposition mentions, are already radical. That's why they seek out these other ideas to reinforce their own in the first place. There's no change in radicals on either side. The group people we target is moderate people. But also a lot of conservative anger that causes people to move underground is about I think that about conservative voters are not represented enough. The narrative is that they're not making our voices heard in the mainstream. Therefore, we need to move to underground sources like parlor to voice our ideas. Proposition takes away the initial reason that many moderate people move underground in the first place. They don't see staunch right-wing narratives in channels like Fox News spreading and legitimizing ideas that the election was stolen without any check and balance that is immediately visible, they don't feel like they need to go to an alternative source because they're not being represented in the mainstream. It is not a coincidence that problematic news sources such as InfoWars or One American News that mostly loudly amplify intolerant views came to rise along with Fox. They were legitimized by it. If you've never heard of fake news via Fox or if you see them directly disproved, where do you get the motivation to go looking for more information on the ground? Right? So therefore, on proposition we give you is a world in which a people are more likely to be able to see ideas that directly counter certain narratives they see therefore they're less likely to buy into certain harmful narratives in the first place right therefore we give them accurate information we give information on either side so that they can make the decisions themselves whereas on opposition they tell you that there's only one correct source of information and you know you know you have liberal news here, conservative there, and you have two different groups of people who watch them. Therefore, an entire half of society never gets access to the kind of information that opposition wants so basically for the youth to get access to, right? Because sure, you can keep shielding people who may be more sensitive, who may be hurt forever, but the fact is that there's still people out there in society who listen to these narratives and act on them. Therefore, even if, sure, they feel temporary um, satisfaction because these news channels are saying things that sound nice to them, people in society still believe the opposite and will go out to do things like shoot up entire restaurants, shoot up things like Buffalo, the Buffalo shooting because they believe they replace their theory, right? We care about social change to the extent that it happens in actual society because news is just information, right? It's what happens as a result of it that matters. If we move on, yes, I'll take the PRI. Yeah, exposure and engagement exists for the most politically salient issues that we've already explained. Like BLM still had engagement from both hours of the spectrum. You still need to justify our first argument. Why is it okay for every discussion about gender dysphoria for individuals and trans people to be dehumanized in every single media house? Okay, look at it this way, yeah? If you only ever see one side of the argument, and then you, the moment that you see the other side, for example, if you don't believe that people may be able to identify as a different gender, this is all you see all the time without any other counter alternatives going along with it. This is what you're going to believe. You're going to be set in it. The moment you see another alternative saying that, oh, trans people deserve to live. They have their gender. You discard this because that's confirmation bias. We take away the ability for them to do it in the first place. Sure, some issues have um, discussions on both sides, but the issue in the status quo is that it's so divided into different sources for, that are targeted towards different groups of people. As on our side of the house, you never are able to make these people change their minds. And also on our side of the house, movement get better because they're able to you know check these arguments so it will spread them as logic and discuss them make them interact not just exist, exist in a vacuum where people will never be able to you know uh, change their minds moving on to the second clash on minorities you say that you spread respect dehumanizing political rhetoric 
the minorities will traumatize and the conservative people are more persuasive than you know, normal people. Let's address too much persuasion of the very doctrine in our position. Number one, that the, the the parents doctrine operates upon controversial issues of public importance. Our position is an example of things like suicide, which isn't controversial. The, the way that the fact that they leave with us in the first place means they don't understand the fairness doctrine. Secondly, discriminatory rhetoric is not portrayed as neutral. No part of the fairness doctrine does that. What happens is the discriminatory rhetoric is countered with anti discriminatory rhetoric and logic. But secondly, a minority is in safe space. At no point in time has news media existed for the purpose of being a safe space for minority groups. Their purpose is to provide fair, accurate information upon which people can be informed and make the best decisions possible. If People want solidarity and community, there are alternatives. They can go to social media, they have to go to forums. But let's flip this. Dehumanizing political rhetoric is far more potent on opposition. Instead of potentially being watered down by having opposing people present to call out certain ideas, for example, by having two speakers discussing each other's viewpoints and providing alternative arguments, these narratives fester in the minds of people who see them over and over again within an echo chamber. The same dehumanizing political rhetoric exists on up. The difference is that people don't have any immediate source of alternative viewpoints to check themselves and tone on their beliefs, and thus are more likely to radicalize, believe in these narratives, acting them, for example, in the Buffalo shooting. And conservatives are more persuasive. Look, the ideas that are frankly ridiculous wins out more on their side because people like Jordan Peterson are pushed into spheres where there are only conservative people who will reinforce these ideas and to listen to him and champion him, right? Only when we have an alternative um, a viewpoint to interact with it and point out the fact that there are certain ideas that are not actually that strong logically, can people see that, oh, maybe it is not such a good thing. But on your side, when you push these ideas into these places where you know you get an echo chamber, you never break people out of these ideas. We can't fear that all different people will win, but more importantly, the likelihood of stupid people like Ben Shapiro getting beaten and having to interact with actual qualified people is far higher. Therefore, what do we get? On top position, we get a world in which we help democracy because we give them information. That is all. We give them information upon which they can make decisions. Opposition does not do that because they give you one sided information. Secondly, on minorities, we give you a world in which social change is actually more likely to happen, whereas opposition only gives you like an illusion of solvency because you hear comforting things on the news. Therefore, for proposition, thank you. Uh, I thank the government third speaker for the speech. Can I have the opposition third speaker here? here. I, am I audible? Yes, you are. I'll take P Y's in chat. Starting in three, two, one. It was high time we took off the rose-tinted glasses of the prop and call it for what it is, a doctrine of bigotry and of oppression. The problem with the proposition's case thus far was their infatuation with liberalizing the world without acknowledging how this policy works. Yes, we agreed that we will push liberal viewpoints on conservative news and also push conservative viewpoints on liberal news. The problem here was that they can't claim which of these outcomes are going to be more likely, which means most of these outcomes are then ambiguous. Let's highlight the strategic mistake of their case and be clear about what the burden actually is. This proposition team took it upon themselves to impose better behavior. Behavior. And this was important because they took it upon themselves to prove liberalization. Because in the first prop speech, they call out negative forms of rhetoric, such as like being homophobic, and therefore they fail here and have nothing left standing. But the problem was that they can't have a case shift later on and lower their burden because the third prop shoots themselves in the foot by creating a massive case shift, saying we are not pushing for liberalism, but we're just informing people by letting you hear other viewpoints and other rebuttals, which means you become a more informed citizen. The reason why this can't work is an extremely soft case because if their stance is just that we want more information then that has no impact because it meant that on their side this this was why they needed to defend this burden specifically because all of their impacts about making a better democracy all of their impacts on questioning yourself meant that it was contingent on outcomes so it wasn't that our case was straw manning them by forcing them to defend the outcomes it was because in order for any of their impacts to be meaningful it needed to change people's behavior meaningfully otherwise the debate can't take place. Therefore, you get put into a difficult position because at the end of the prop bench, you have, are left to question which speaker should you discard entirely and why? Was it their first speech on whether you wanted to push people to better forms of behavior or was it their third speech on just giving them more information and democratic empowerment? In comparison, our stance was simple. If we prove the fairness doctrine did more harm than good, we won. This was not a merely a ne negative case because we prevented a massive negative externality from happening, one that was irreversible 
people. And we also explain why you know, on our side, even without this policy, things were getting better and that was important because it means the excesses of harm they framed to you from the first speech are entirely out of the round. With this, Team Vietnam is on a very good track to losing this debate quite clearly. Three issues in this speech. First, on the principal justification in democracy. Second, on information and echo chambers. And third, on the innate failures of this policy. First, I want to know that the prop concedes the importance of abiding by moral minimums every time they claim there are some things we should not discuss. There's an important clarification here because OP is not saying all conservative ideals are harmful. There are certain moral minimums you ought to follow that don't platform dehumanizing rhetoric. And the reason for this is quite simple. Because even if the state had the had had obligation to platform information, the state also had to abide by standards that if we prove a large social harm, then the negative duty to not do this outweighs their positive duty to put this information. So given that all private actors have to abide by negative duties to not perpetuate social harms, we explain that this falls in line with that and the state ought not to do this. Our argument was not that you immediately see racist views and you become racist. Don't let them get away by simplifying this. We explained that it was the creation of permission mechanisms that gradually le legitimize dehumanizing rhetoric in the public sphere. What does this look like? Realistically, we're not saying that all forms of discussions had to be toxic and dehumanizing because and being anti-immigration doesn't necessarily mean that you have to put down all Muslims as being people who are terrorists. But... This, they concede to the reason as to why this will work in, the, in their own speeches when they claim media companies are dying and therefore have an incentive to make their forms of rhetoric emotional, to polarize people. If this is true, then that incentive is also symmetric on their end, which means that they will also want to capitalize off this rhetoric. In fact, I think it gets worse under their side because if it's true that media companies can't polarize based on their own their, their own audience basis, they were now on one end of the spectrum because now everything is neutralized. It means they're going to rely on these things far more, which means that you're able to have far more polarizing and emotional discussions on their end. So it doesn't automatically equate to dehumanization, but per their own mechanism, it will be. We hear two responses. The first is that very late in third prop, they say dehumanizing conservative rhetoric also exists on the opposition. The reason as to why it's different is twofold. First, this is state-sanctioned oppression because the state mandates this. So even if on our side it exists, the state has the ability to call them out and it's not platforming this on already liberal sites. And the second thing here was that most of most of these things are already going down, which means people already recognize people are quite media literate and they don't want to see really forms of polarized news. The difference here is that they are no longer able to call out those bad news because of the permission mechanism we highlighted from first, that you say all of these things are worth discussing, that everything has to be put into the public sphere. That is when you can no longer call them out the same way which you could do previously, which is why our organic mechanisms of framing out their worst excesses of harm get lost under their side, which is why it's not symmetric. We explained that if their side is true and society has been informed and empowered, then the 70% of people who are politically conscious will be participating in politics anyways. But now all political discussions are more toxic per our first argument. If their claim is that people are open-minded, then probably they want to be open-minded on our side as well and move out to do these things. But they no longer have the ability to do that on their side because these forms of discussions get more, more toxic. Which leads into the second argument about information echo chambers. But before that, I'll take a point. I think you just shoot yourself in the foot. On your side, the state lets anti-trans rhetoric happen at the same harm occur. What principle okay. are you standing on? So I just responded to this by saying there's a categorical difference between the news company doing this and you forcing another news company who has never done this to then do this. Because your claim here is that if they are anti-trans rhetoric, then the way that you are going to solve it is by letting the neutralizing viewpoint change people's minds. With conceits, once again, your burden was then on impact. But the reason as to why we highlighted was that people are more likely to have better discussions when you don't force these things per the permission mechanism. But second, I think this leads nicely in the second argument because it proves those discussions get way more toxic under your side. From the first op setup, we explain that even without the fairness doctrine, media companies have incentives to explore diversity of viewpoints because consumers are more media literate and will be highly critical of extremely one-sided biased reporting. So therefore, people do have some small incentives to liberalize independent of this policy. But the prop failed to answer a crucial question. If people are so used to cultures of convenience, the moment you shove something they aren't used to, why won't they go somewhere 
else. Therefore, immediately after the introduction of the fairness doctrine, it's a golden time for political opportunists to amplify anti-establishment rhetoric. They can hop on the train to frame the state as Orwellian, as forcing their ideologies upon us. Sure, fringe underground media will exist regardless. They are correct. But now they'll capitalize on the trust deficit between people and the state. Given that these underground news sources do not fall under the doctrine, they become far worse. I want to know why this argument is important because props arguments are all contingent on the circumstances where they are polarized. Maybe you believe their side, maybe you believe ours. This does not matter on who you're trying to affect because these media sites get empowered and therefore they concede from first proposition that a small amount of people, the vocal polarized minority, now get pushed towards these things. So even if it's a small amount of people who are going into underground news sites, it's a massive impact. So their second their second prop response on saying it's hard to go underground doesn't count because we prove that the people who are are going to become far worse here. The third issue was down on the inherent failures of the doctrine. So there are, there are mechanisms that says exposure could work. We explain it could work in the opposite way as well. But this means that they have very little defense. They, they, they can't just claim we will regulate it. Not only is it very difficult to regulate every single piece of content that's put out, but these are unquantifiable metrics. You can, me you can measure the time given to a speaker, but you can't measure qualitative metrics, such as the charisma and other parts of how you people subconsciously perceive them, which is why if media companies were so bad as they wanted to say, they get infinitely worse on the proposition and that was something we were never willing to defend. For all these reasons, you had to oppose. Uh, I find the speaker for the space. Can I have the opposition reply speaker here? here. Audible, right? Starting in three, two, one. Panel, what was the outcome of Team Proposition's arguments on polarization, news quality, journalism, and democracy? All of them in, were never argued in abstract. All of them had an outcome. They compounded and said that polarization um, the outcome of polarization is a more empathetic society. They told you that news quality meant better decision-making. They told you that better journalism also enabled better climates for discussion. They talked to you about democracy and the outcome of democracy was better voter literacy. They never once argued the abstract concept of having more information, which is why we never straw man their case. And that is why the burden that we imposed and extrapolated to them from first opposition was always correct. But second proposition and third proposition never wanted to actually engage and defend their own burden. The failure to actually uphold the minimum standard in this debate for their team is why they lost. Three issues in this speech. Number one, the fairness doctrine and how it contravenes moral minimums. Secondly, on opt-in to traditional media or pushing them further underground. And third, on polarization. On the fair first issue, on the fairness doctrine and how it contravenes moral minimums. Note that proposition's only engagement was parallel in its best form. They kept rehashing and their only response was that it does not matter if there's dehumanizing rhetoric because there is always something else there to counter it. But what we said is that we should not have kept legitimizing them in the first place, that it is better for the already not racist, not transphobic media houses to remain the way they are, as opposed to forcing them into discussions and forcing them into the debates where previously we could platform, for example, the issues of trans individuals in a, in a vacuum, but now you're forced to engage with the oppressor in those instances, which is why them just saying we will engage anyway is not actually important for two reasons that we already gave to you. Number one in terms they cannot guarantee the outcome always sways towards humanity and empathy. But number two, that if that is the case, that therefore we ought not to force individuals who have to be traumatized in the process of advocacy. Why is it that you always have to consent to being told you're illegitimate, to being told you're mentally ill? On our side, you never have to consent to, or the prerequisite was never trauma in the first place. We then also explained to you how the permission mechanisms was how you created a more polarized, bigoted society. It was not that the minute in which liberal houses have another news source that is conservative that therefore they become racist. It was the idea that constant exposure to dehumanizing rhetoric, the permission mechanisms created, constantly seeing these kinds of discussions and assuming that this is normal debate means that people are able to emulate these discussions and emulate said beliefs, which means that which means that you can't categorically call them racist, but just engaging in the neutral quote-unquote fair discussion that society has mandated. Which is why therefore the negative duty the state had was more important. 
government to not cause harm to these individuals, to not be called, to not be a culprit in oppression by forcing all media houses to not be participants in said oppression, as opposed to the uh, positive burden of media houses or the state wanting to give more information, which could have been achieved elsewhere. Secondly, on opting to traditional media or going further underground. Note that this issue entirely whacked out Proposition's case, because here we engage with the idea that opt-in was the prerequisite for any of their harms to actually manifest. Their only responses is that it takes far too much work or that individuals actually become smaller because you broadcast them en masse. We told you two things. We told you, number one, in terms of the trust deficit and the social engineering of your choices and how individuals will pivot elsewhere. But number two, you're not broadcasting these individuals and giving them a platform to feel safe, to feel safe, because number one, you're invading their safe spaces currently. You're invading Fox News and their only source of conservative media. But even in the places where you quote unquote broadcasted them, you never guaranteed them the conservative value actually winning out. Us being platformed on New York Times never meant that I felt safe as a conservative in those spaces if you couldn't prove empirically that they would always agree with my ideology. Therefore, they had to agree with going underground and they had to agree with the echo chambers, and that is their harm. Last on polarization. The structural scenarios we pointed out to you were pertinent in illustrating how the fairness doctrine plays out. They can't find them because we told you that none of these were actually contravening what the fairness doctrine is, but these loopholes were inherent. So we flipped the first argument on polarization insofar as that is how discussion played out. I time to figure for this speech. Can I have the proposition to figure out in that debate? Yeah, sure. Start my speech in three, two, one. Considering that our reply spent his entire reply rebutting, let's do this. Our opponents defended on an almost impossibly uncharitable version of the fairness doctrine when for some reason we have to platform racist, homophobic, or intolerant views. Considering that our P1 proved that we could regulate news organization to operate on good faith, or simply that conservative views is not all straight up racism, we collapse our opponents' engagement. But also, let's respond to this. They kept telling us that liberalization doesn't happen on our side and that we have to prove this happened. We don't do this. P1 told you liberals refuse to engage based on moral superiority and the wokeness of issue. P2 told you liberal movements tend to have the tendencies to message among themselves. P3 put this up top of her speech. We do not understand why they keep burden pushing this. We, what we do on our side is not uh, liberalization, but we make people chill out. People don't uh, keep, uh, people don't keep just advocating for their side without any regard for others because we break conservative and liberal bubbles because the better form of behavior isn't liberalized. It's the engagement with the other side. It's listening to the other side. It's the understanding that the other side is somewhat legitimate too, so that you can engage with them and not just fight with each other. But also, let's check out the rest of their responses. Remember what? They told you that people will undergrad. We think we have given you sufficient response to this, but we also flip this preemptively and undercuts O3's analysis of how the status quo get worse. Because we lower underground, because we render them unnecessary, because we let people like Jordan Peterson on national broadcast. We think for those who love to listen to themselves, debunk them as students, they will be happy to do this. But also, uh, the second thing they said is that political discussions are more toxic and more offensive to people, so they take away safe space. Okay, panel, the reason why political discussion are st uh, toxic in the status quo is because you straw man the other side argument. The reason why uh, the reason why people are being called mentally ill is because conservative believes this because they have no interaction with trans people. So now liberals, when they hear conservatives say this, they're like, oh, you're so toxic, you're so stupid, we don't talk to you anymore. So conservatives fester because they, there's no one to challenge what they think. So we think it is far better to confront than let them fester in quiet conservative. And so, and so in terms of liberal movement, in terms of protecting minority, we better achieve the end goal of actually interaction with people, of actually telling them that we matter, of actually debunking their stupid ideology. But also, third thing, they say that, they say that, oh, you are platforming, oh, you can't impose certain morality upon people because this is the more, there is certain minimum of morality of the state. Okay. If it's the minimum morality of the state, this is a commonly accepted thing in establishment because as we said from P1, things like racial slurs, they, these are the things that new in the, new in the status quo don't even discuss. These are the minimum uh, morality. What opposition is actually referring to is just the difference in opinion. And what we do change is the exclusivity of one side of the story because we don't platform one opinion, we platform multiple opinions so that they have the opportunity to engage with each other. 
But also, let's move on. Uh, they also say that it's immoral to manipulate how, pe uh, how people's mind works. Uh, okay, we changed the status quo of manipulation by disallowing one-sided reporting. We think they dropped this in 03, and we think that's very reflective of just how this principle just does not stand. At the end of the day, panel, we think opposition is very concerned uh, and should be concerned not on the impact of the fairness doctrine, but the technicality of implementation. They told you two things is that one, the wrong people are being persuasive. Things like people like Ben Shapiro tend to be far more persuasive than some feminist academics for some reason. But also, the second thing they tell you that news companies will exploit loopholes. It address two things. Let's address these two things. Number one, if the wrong people are more persuasive, you are getting the wrong people. Two, maybe your site isn't as good as you think it is. Go back home, think about the other side stuff and figure out how your side addresses them. If you believe that your side is right, figure out how to appeal to those people who don't agree with you. Because, and thirdly, the counterfactual is worse because Jordan Peterson sits in his little conservative bubble and keeps telling people, keeps debunking feminist students and telling them, oh, feminism is false. Secondly, uh, news companies will exploit loopholes. They didn't engage with our ship and incentive under regulations, but we also told you that even if some does, we create a new standard of legitimacy and a different kind of competition. As long as the majority of news doesn't exploit the loophole, the race at the bottom of the status quo becomes counterintuitive. And the third argument comes in, competition changes, we better news quality, we better inform voters, and we better democracy as a whole. So proud to win on proposition.